Now, if you will, I am continuing a uh, series this morning on the three gifts. The three gifts that the, the wise men brought to the child Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 2. This morning we're looking at the second gift, which is frankincense. Last week we talked about gold, that gold was for the king. We talked about that Jesus is the king, he was, his kingdom was truth, and he himself was truth, that Jesus was the truth that we are so desperately looking for. His kingdom is truth. This morning I want to talk about the idea of frankincense. So turn, if you will, we read it last week, and we'll read it again next week, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9. <clears throat> the wise men have traveled from the east, and they have gone to Herod the king in Jerusalem and said that they are searching for this child who is born as the new king. So they've gone to Herod. Matthew 2 and 9. When they heard the king, that is Herod, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped Jesus. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's pray. Lord, I ask in the next few moments that you will speak to us. God, we long to hear from you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I shared last week about a birthday present that I had received, thinking about receiving gifts for this series. And I shared last week about a, a, a time when my dad gave me a birthday present and kind of tricked me a little bit. In preparation for this message, I was thinking about a time when I was in West Africa. On one of the many trips that I've taken to West Africa, I've probably been 30 times in my life, and I continue to work for my dad at his missions organization and um, continue to grow primarily to Ghana. We had traveled uh, up, actually, to the country north of Ghana, to Burkina Faso, and we had built a church in this village, and I'm talking about remote. Burkina Faso is, is probably the poor, not probably, it is the poorest country I've ever been in. And this was a remote village in the poorest country I've ever been in. So I want you to understand what this looked like and felt like. But we were there. We were dedicating this church. We had built a church for them to worship in. It was the only concrete block structure in the entire village. All the rest of the houses were mud, mud huts with straw roofs. When you think of Africa, what, this is what you think of is what this village looked like. But we had built this church, and we traveled way up into Burkina Faso to dedicate it. We dedicated this church, and I preached. And at the end of it, the village came together and wanted to give me something. And they presented me with a goat. They gave me a goat at the end of this dedication. And I said to Sammy, I said, Sammy, I, I can't take this goat, Sammy. I said, I said I'm, not a, I'm not a rich guy, Sammy, but I said, I could buy this village. I can't let them give me a goat. I, I have more money personally than everybody in this village put together. And Sammy said, Travis, you have to take this goat. They've, they've, they've given it. They've done this for you. It's already done. They've purchased the goat. It's a present for you. It's a gift for you. You have to take it. And so we did. We strapped it into the back of the pickup truck. and <laughs> Me and Sammy and the goat drove all the way back down to uh, Ghana. Now, a number of people, I've told this story before, maybe, maybe here, but in other places I've told this story, and inevitably, someone comes up to me after the service and asks me what happened to the goat. I never even thought that, that that's not really the point of that story. So, in order to cut you off at the pass and save you from having to ask me about what happened to the goat, I will tell you, we ate that goat. So, you didn't think it was going to end that way, did you? I'm sorry. <laughs> you, 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 uh, the, the, the United States government frowns upon me bringing livestock back from Africa. Sammy doesn't have a place to store it, so when we got back to Kumasi, we killed that goat, and we ate it in some goat stew, and it was pretty good. So, to save you from asking me, that's what happened to that goat, unfortunately. So, the reason that I tell that story is this. They had the goat. They had bought the goat. The present, the, the gift was ready. It was for me. 
What was the only way that that goat wasn't coming back with us to Kumasi? What's the only way that it wasn't coming back with us? The only way that it wasn't coming back to us to Kumasi was if I refused to accept the gift. They said, we have bought this for you. We want to say thank you to you for you helping to build this church. This is our way to show gratitude. Here is the goat. The only way that the goat stayed there in that village was if I refused to take it. That is what we see with this issue of the gift of frankincense. Frankincense shows us Jesus, our high priest. Gold represents Jesus, our king. Frankincense represents Jesus, our priest, or Jesus, our high priest. Turn, if you will, now to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 30. Over and over again in the priestly duties, frankincense is used. Turn, if you will, to Exodus chapter 30 and verse 34. Exodus 30 and 34. This is when the children of Israel have left Egypt. They're in the the desert, and God is giving them the rules of how to do offerings and how to build the tabernacle and all these things you're supposed to do. And the Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stacti and oncha and galbanon and pure frankincense. With these sweet spices there shall be an equal amount of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourself according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. First thing is this with frankincense. Here's the thing. God says, this is what I want you to make. I want you to make an incense that you're going to burn in the Holy of Holies. So this incense is going to burn as you make offerings. This is when you take on the Day of Atonement, you take the blood into the Holy of Holies. This altar of incense is going to be burning. And part of the spices that you make the incense, one of the things that's going to be part of it is frankincense. So he says, you're going to make this incense and burn it. But what does he say? God is very clear with Moses. He says, you shall not make any for yourself. He says, if you make any for yourself, that person shall be cut off from my people. Here's the first thing. Our focus should be holiness. Our focus should be holiness. The idea should be relationship with God. Do you want to know why God told them you shall not make any for yourself? Because if he hadn't, everybody would have been making the incense that burns in the, in, the, in the tabernacle. Everybody would have been making the incense that burns in the tabernacle, trying to impress everybody else with their levels of holiness, with their level of relationship. Oh, you smell that? That's the same incense that burns in the tabernacle. You know what that means? It means I'm holier than you are. Because my house smells like God's house, and your house smells like your kid just threw up, right? And we get to make everybody else feel bad about their relationship and about their level of holiness because we are so much better. But our holiness isn't authentic. It isn't real. It isn't relationship. Our holiness is simply consists of burning the same incense that burns in the, ta- in the temple, in the tabernacle. So that that all we're doing is trying to impress people with what it smells like in our house. But it doesn't address the issues that are inside of us. Are we really changed on the inside or are we simply burning incense to make everybody else think that we're holier than we are? In research for this sermon, I want to show you a fascinating website that I ran across. Put that first slide up for me if you will. You see these verses at the top? That's what we just read. Whosoever shall make this incense shall be cut off from his people. Right underneath it is ingredients for how to make your own incense. What? They put the verses at the top of the page. Go to the next slide for me, if you will. 
Then at the bottom, you can order incense. If you're too stupid to make it yourself, you can order it from them. And at the top of the website page are the verses that I just read that says, you shall not make this incense for yourself. What? I, I, I didn't even know what to do with this. You, okay, this is where so many of us are. We don't actually care about holiness. We don't actually care about relationship. We just want everybody to think our house smells nice. We just want the outward trappings of holiness. We just want everybody to think that we love God and God loves us and everything's fine. I want to show you two scriptures from the Old Testament again. Turn, if you will, to Psalm chapter 141 or Psalm 141. This is a Psalm of David. This is a Psalm of David, Psalm 141 and verse 2. I want you to look at David's language. He's calling out to God and he says this, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. He says, I want to pray. I want to lift my hands because I love you, because I'm in relationship with you, because I serve you, God, because my focus is not trying to impress everybody else. My focus is on relationship with God. Look at how authentic and genuine and real David's language is here. He says, I want my prayer to be set before you as the incense that burns into the nostrils of God. The smoke from the incense rises. He says, let my prayer be like that. Now, I want you to compare that to the prophecy from Isaiah. Turn over just a, a little bit to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 13. This is God himself speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the children of Israel. Listen to how genuine and authentic David's language is. Now listen to the rebuke from the mouth of God. Isaiah 1 and 13. God says, bring no more futile sacrifices. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. Look at verse 15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Now that is strong language from God Almighty. But why? It is because they are doing what they were told not to do in Exodus, which is they have the outward trappings of holiness, but inside they are empty. They are, they are, they're nothing. They have no authentic relationship with God. The first thing that we are called to is the idea that we focus on holiness. We don't focus on trying to impress everybody else, trying to show everybody else how great we are, how wonderful we are, how wonderful our house smells, how it looks like the temple, how it smells like the tabernacle. God says, I want you to raise your prayers like incense in the words of David. But he says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. We have to get back in touch with the idea that of holiness is relationship, is authentic, is real. It's not about trying to impress everybody else, or it's not about pretending like everything's great and nothing's wrong. And no, no, you know, everything's fine. Everything's okay. It's not about buying holy incense on the internet. So that your house smells like what the tabernacle used to smell like. Come on, man. It is about where is your relationship with God. Not what does it smell like. What is it like in here? What is it like? Now turn, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 16. Again, we're looking at the old covenant to start. And the idea of frankincense that is used throughout the priestly duties. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 11. Now, the God is telling Moses what the priest is supposed to do for the day of atonement. You remember the day of atonement is the holiest of all the feasts, of all the days of the Jewish people. Let me just give you a backstory. They take two goats. This will sound familiar to how I started this. They take two goats. They kill one of those goats and he takes the blood and puts it on the altar. And then they take the other goat and the high priest 
prays over the other goat, lays his hands on the goat, and that's where we get the idea of a scapegoat. And then they release that goat into the wilderness. And the sins of the entire people, all the children of Israel, are in that goat. The priest has put his hands on it. They've killed the one goat. This blood forgives us. Now I take the sins of all the people of Israel. I pray over this goat. I put my hands on it, release it into the desert. And the scapegoat runs far from us, taking the sins of the people. But the problem is... By the end of that day, or at least by the end of the next day, and definitely by the end of that week, everybody in the whole nation will have sinned again. So that time next year, you have to do the same thing over again. You have to have the same day of atonement, and you do the same thing. You kill one goat, you release the other goat. That is what God, God is explaining how Aaron and the high priests after him should handle and deal with the day of atonement. Now I want you to read this, Leviticus 16 and verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense. There it is, that's the frankincense again. With his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do that with, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Second thing is this. Our focus should be revival. Our focus should be revival. The first is our focus is holiness. It's not simply smelling good. It's about who we are on the inside. The next is our focus should be revival. Now, I want to I look at two different things in this. The first is that revival always starts here. Revival always starts here. When you look at the revivals that happened in the Old Testament under some of the godly kings of Judah, For example, when Hezekiah comes to the throne, revival starts with the king, with the priests, with the high priests, with the Levites. You know where revival doesn't start? It doesn't start with the Philistines. It doesn't start with the Canaanites. Revival starts with the people of God, the children of Israel, calling on to God. That's where revival begins. We, unfortunately, so often have gotten it topside down. We always think if all those people will just get saved, revival will start. Listen to me. Revival starts here with us, the priesthood. This place, in this house, this is where revival starts. And the other problem is we always think we can bring revival in by some other means. Revival begins when the people of God turn back to God. When we get passionate about God and the things of God. Revival does not start Now listen to me, I want you to hang in there with me on this. Revival does not start through a political process or through a political party. Okay? Too often, too often Christians, in particular in this country, we have have bought into a bill of goods that sounds and is totally and completely wrong. What we have decided is if we can elect Christians to all these elected positions, if we can elect Christians, if we can have a Christian in the White House, if we can have a Christian as a a, a hundred Christian senators, if we can have the whole House of Representatives as Christians, if we can make the Supreme Court Christians, then what will happen? Revival. But that's like not how it works. We have bought into a bad bill of goods. That's not how it works. Listen, the the Republican Party does not have the answers and cannot bring about revival. The Democratic Party does not have the answers and cannot bring about revival. Okay? It doesn't matter if we elect a born-again Christian to every position from dog catcher to president. It will not bring revival Because revival cannot flow through a man-made instrument such as politics. Revival flows out of this place. Revival flows out of this place. Don't, 
We cannot sell out on the idea of revival. Revival is started by somebody else in some other place. If all the heathens would get saved, we'd have revival. Revival starts here. The revival starts here. Now, more specifically, I want you to look back at something again. Look at verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. Now, this is fascinating. A goat, the blood of the goat, covers all the sin of the entire nation of Israel. But the blood of a bull covers Aaron's own sin. Now, I don't know a lot about livestock or animals but I can tell you one thing a bull is significantly bigger than a goat and the blood of a bull is significantly more than the blood of a goat do you see what God is saying to Aaron and all the high priests and is continuing to say to us so often we're obsessed with everybody else's sin Oh, if that guy can just do right. Oh, if they could just do it. So while revival starts here corporately, yes. But you know where revival really starts? In you, in me. See, what happens is we point to everybody else. Oh, if that person just get their life right. Oh, if they could just get their life right. I think I've told this story before, but I used to work for my, for my parents, and we would go and do couples conferences. My mom and dad would speak on marriage, and we'd do like 10, 11, 12 couples conferences a year all over the southeast. I would drive there and sell materials for my folks. I was in my 20s at the time, and we would do registration, and people would come by and pick up their name tags. I remember I'm at one couples conference one time, and all the name tags are out on the table. And a lady comes by and picks up her and her husband's name tag. And then she's looking over the rest of the name tags that are on the table. She's looking at them. And then she finally stops at a name and she goes, oh, I'm so glad they're here. And then she looks at me and she goes, they really need this. And I was like, lady, you're here. You're bound to need this a little bit if you're at the same conference. But isn't that what we do? We're like, God's like, hey, Travis, what about that thing? And I'm like, oh, I'm praying for Chris. If Chris could just get control of that, his life would be so much better. And God's like, no, Travis, that thing in your life, that issue, that problem, that sin, that addiction. I'm like, oh, I'm praying for Courtney. If Courtney could just get her life worked out, right? And that's what we do. We project on everybody else. Oh, I'm killing this goat for your sin. And I'm killing this goat for your sin. And I'm killing this goat for your sin. And God says, no, that's fine. But the blood of a bull is required to cover your sin. A goat covers the sin of the entire nation. A bull is required just to cover Aaron's sin and his family's sin. God is saying revival starts in this place, but more specifically, it starts with us. We must get in touch with who we are, what we have done, and ask for forgiveness before revival ever starts. Aaron had to kill the bull and offer sacrifices for his own sin before he could ever intercede for the sins of the nation. I cannot tell you the number of Facebook posts that I read about revival returning to America. I'm not opposed to revival, but the blood of some bulls is going to have to be spilled over my problems before revival comes. What we want to do is talk about revival for everybody else, but we don't want to deal with the issues that are endemic in our own life. You have to make sacrifice for yourself. You have to acknowledge your own sin. You have to ask for forgiveness for what you have done before you can help anybody else. Aaron had to shed the blood of a bull before he could intercede for the nation. You want to pray for revival for your nation? You should. I just want to tell you, is there things in your life that shouldn't be there? Because before you pray for revival for America, you need to pray for revival for yourself. I'm the same way. Before I can pray, God, do something for all of you, I have to pray, God, do something in me. Now, here's the final thing. We've looked at the old covenant. Now look, if you will, at Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to work through the book of Hebrews a little bit here. It's going to look like a Baptist sword drill. But we're going to work through 
Hebrews. So first we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. What do we say? The gold represents Jesus as king. Frankincense represents Jesus as our priest or more specifically our high priest. Making atonement, making offering, making sacrifice for all of us. So we see Jesus as king. Now we see Jesus as high priest. The writer of the book of Hebrews does a wonderful job of presenting who Jesus is as our high priest in this moment. Look, if you will, Hebrews 4 and 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So he makes it clear right there. Jesus is the high priest for everyone. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a high priest. His name is Jesus. He understands everything we've been through because he was tempted with sin and addiction and everything that all of us are tempted with, except he did not sin. So he is, making, he is making intercession for us before God the Father. So that what? So that we may come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have a high priest and he is making intercession for us. Now, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 23. Hebrews 7 and 23. The writer continues. He says, also, there were many priests but they were prevented by death from continuing. So he says there were a lot of priests, but eventually all priests die. But he, that is Jesus, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He will not die. We have a high priest, immortal, eternal. He will not die. And all he does is exist to make intercession for us. That's all he does. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Look at the beginning of 25. He is also able to save to the uttermost. Now, we have a high priest. We can come boldly before the throne. He always lives to make intercession for us. He will never die. He will never pass away. And what he does is intercede for us. Hebrews 9 and verse 11. Hebrews 9 and 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So he says, if the blood of bulls and goats sanctifies, how much more shall the blood of Christ? Which means it shall do much, much more. It shall sanctify any sin, any person, anywhere, any time. There is nothing that we can do that cannot be sanctified by the blood of our high priest who is in heaven interceding for us. We have to get a hold of this. How much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ Cleanse your conscience. Now finally, Hebrews chapter 10, over one chapter, 10 and 11. Chapter 10, verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. They knew that, didn't they? Even when God gave the law to Moses and to Aaron, they had to know deep down inside, killing this goat cannot really cleanse me of my sin. There's got to be something better. And there was. They were waiting for the Messiah that would save his people from their sin. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He has offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And with one sacrifice he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The final thing is this. Our focus should be Jesus. Our focus should be holiness. Our focus should be revival. But ultimately our focus should be Jesus. Now here's what happens. We can't believe that Jesus actually died for our sins. This is what they were struggling with and this is what the writer of the book of Hebrews kept going back to and back to and back to because they believed that it can't possibly be enough. Just one man, just his shed blood, how can it be enough? How can it, how can it do, how can it heal? How can it change? How can it forgive my sin? But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Jesus has finished it. It's done. It's complete. This is what we struggle with. And this this is what I hate that we struggle with is the idea that I cannot really find freedom, that I cannot really find redemption, that I cannot really find grace, that I cannot really find mercy, that I cannot really find forgiveness. We believe God can forgive everybody else's sin, but because we know what we've done, because we know the stuff that we've never even told our spouse, because we know the terrible things that run through our own mind, And the awful stuff that we've done in the past, we believe that God can forgive everybody else, but he cannot forgive me. Jesus shed his blood, one sacrifice for all sins forever. One sacrifice for all sins forever. That one sacrifice for all sins forever. What happens is we focus on ourselves and our own sin instead of focusing on God. And more specifically on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He is our high priest forever and ever. He cannot die. He will not be killed. He is eternal. He is immortal. And he is in heaven offering intercession for you right now before God the Father. And his one offering of his blood forgave all sins forever. For all sins forever. That, that is it. We, we live in levels of unwanted and unneeded self-condemnation where we hate who we are, we hate what we've done, and we refuse to believe that we can be forgiven. Everybody else can be forgiven, but I can't. Listen to me. One offering for all sins forever. One offering for all sins forever. Every time that Satan takes the mirror and holds it up to your own life and says, look at who you are and look at what you've done and look at all the horrible things you've done and look at the people you've hurt and look at the people you've disappointed, you tell him one offering for all sin for all time. One offering for all sin for all time. He is our high priest. He is our high priest. So, what does it look like then? Let me close with this. When I first started pastoring, I was one of a staff pastor at a large church. And because we were so big, we had a team that handled a lot of the pastoral care. But someone, one pastor was on staff, and they were the on-call emergency staff pastor for the whole week. So we had emergency number that you could call the church 24 hours a day. And that number would forward to whoever's cell phone was on, uh, was, was on call for that week. So you'd be on call for the whole week, 24 hours, seven days. Then you'd go off, other guys would do it. Six or seven weeks later, you'd be on call again for the week. So it was my week to be on call. And I was actually in my office. And the receptionist called me and she said, hey, there's a guy that wants to talk to a pastor, somebody, and since you're on call, would you talk to him? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So he came up to my office. This is about 
almost 10 years ago now. So I don't, I'm not much smarter than I am, uh, than I was, but I'm a little smarter. But this is almost 10 years ago. I'm just beginning in the ministry. I want to help people, but I don't always know exactly the right thing to say. So he comes to me and sits down in my office and I don't recognize him, I don't know him. He claims to have some sort of connection to the church that I'm at, but I never could understand what the connection was and I didn't know his name, didn't recognize his face, I'd never seen him before. He he proceeds to tell me this story of where his life is at. He tells me he's a doctor, medical doctor, he's treating patients, Somehow someone approached him on the internet or somehow and asked him to begin. Did he want to make some extra money? He said yes. And they told him about how he could start writing prescriptions online. And he could make extra money. And he began to write hundreds and hundreds of prescriptions every week that were used by some sort of prescription mill in Florida. Because, because of course, it's always in Florida. So he's in some prescription mill in Florida somewhere. And he's writing prescriptions for painkillers and, you know, steroids and all these things that are illegal and, and, you know, all this stuff. And he claims to have all these patients and people. And he's writing hundreds and hundreds of prescriptions. As, as sin always does, it leads you into places and leads you to people that you never thought you would hang out with and places you never thought you would go. Because of this prescription writing thing, he begins to hang out with a different type of people. He meets a young woman and he begins an affair with this woman. He's married, he has two kids, he's a doctor. He's now writing illegal prescriptions online for an online internet prescription mill in Florida. He's having an affair with his, on his wife and he just proceeds to tell me all of this. I say, okay, why are you here? He says to me, okay, he says, last week I was indicted in federal court in Florida for this prescription thing. My license to practice medicine has been suspended. My wife found out about the affair when I was indicted in federal court. She's left me. She's taken my kids. He says, I've got nothing left. I'm living in an empty house. My wife is gone. My kids are gone. He said, I'm about to be, I'm about to be indicted in Florida. I'm about to be arrested and I'm going to federal prison for these drug charges. And he said, I just wanna know what you think I should do or what what, what advice do you have? So I gave him some thoughts on it, but then I said to him, I said, look, you've, you've gotta get back in touch with your relationship with Jesus. I said, I can give you some advice and some help and some counsel, but I said, you, you need to be back with Jesus again. You, you, you're here, you're at a church, you're talking to a pastor, you must have some kind of relationship or had a relationship with God. I said, you need to fall in love with Jesus. You need to rededicate your life. You need to reignite your passion and your love. You need to be, get in relationship. All the stuff we just talked about, focus on Jesus, focus on holiness, find individual revival, all of this stuff. I said, that's what you need. He said, well, I just, he said, I just, I, I, I can't. He said, I just thought you'd have advice or counsel. And I said, listen to me, I've got some advice, but ultimately my advice is Jesus. I said, I don't know what to tell you, I'm a pastor. I said, my advice is Jesus. And he just stood up in his chair. And I, I thought he was going to beat me up, I'll be honest with you. He scared me. We're sitting, a desk is in between us. And I said, my advice is Jesus. And he just stood up like that. And I was like, you know, (laughs) I didn't know what he was going to do. And he said, you don't understand. It's too late for me. Jesus can't help me. And he turned around and walked out of my office. I never saw him again. I don't remember what his name is. I don't know how he came to that church or how he talked to me. And he said, you don't understand. It's too late for me. Jesus can't help me. And he was gone. Later on, as you get older and wiser, you think to yourself, what would I have done differently? Here's what I would have done differently. 
I would have jumped to my feet just like he did, and I would have gone around that desk and grabbed a hold of him, and I would have told him, it's never too late. It's never too late. You, it's never too late. Jesus is never not enough. Jesus is our eternal high priest. His blood was shed once for all sin forever. I would have set him for all sin forever. I would have told him that over and over again. I would have wrapped him in a bear hug and pleaded with him not to leave. I would have told him Jesus can forgive anyone anywhere. His blood has been shed for all sin forever. That's what I should have done. But I didn't. Because I'm young and I was a little scared of him and intimidated and I didn't. But I'm not ever letting that moment pass me by again. Listen to me. One offering, one sacrifice, his blood, our high priest for all sin forever. It is never too late. It is never too late. Jesus can always help you. He is our eternal, immortal high priest making intercession for us right now. Right now. Right now. He is making intercession for us before God the Father for your sin. God doesn't hate you. God isn't angry with you. God isn't mad at you. God isn't yelling at you from heaven. Do better. Quit screwing up. Quit making mistakes. Quit sinning. You're embarrassing me. That is not God. Jesus stands between God the Father and me. I'm here. God the Father's over there and Jesus in the middle. And when God the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. Our high priest. And God says, Look at the sin in Travis's life. Look at the mistakes. Look at the dumb stuff. Look at the addiction. Look at all the things that he's done. And Jesus says, Dad, don't look at him. He says, look at me. He says, look at me. And when God the Father looks at me, he sees his son, my high priest. His blood shed once and forever for all sin, for all time. It's never too late. Jesus can always help. It's never too late. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And for, for by that one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Keep that up for me. You are being perfected. You say, I've sinned, and God says, you're perfect and you say, I'm addicted, and God says, you're perfect. And you say, I'm a loser, and God says, you're perfect. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Are we perfect yet? No. Are we becoming perfect? Yes. We are being sanctified. We are being sanctified. I know this seems like a little bit of an in-depth and intense message a week before Christmas. But listen to me, Christmas isn't about a little baby that was born 2,000 years ago. It was about our high priest, our high priest. One offering, he is perfected forever, those who are being sanctified. The world and Satan and your sin says loser, says addict says you're in chains, says you're in bondage, says you'll never be free. And Jesus, by his one offering, says you are perfect. You are being sanctified. You are free. You are no longer bound. You are no longer chained. One offering from one man for all sin, for all time. And that 
is why I love Christmas. One offering, one man, all sin for all time. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would finish this message in the hearts of every person here. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm simply going to ask you to raise your hand because this isn't about me. This is about you. You know where you're at. You know your sin. You know your problems. You know your issue. You know your addiction. You know whatever it is you're facing. And I'm saying to you, one man shed one offering for all sin for all time. So right now, if you say, that is me, I need that forgiveness. I need to focus back on Jesus. I need to remember that I'm set free, that I'm loved, that I'm forgiven, that I've found grace. If you say, that's me, I want you to put your hand up and put it right back down. Oh, so many hands all over the building. So many hands in every section. Now listen, this is what it's about. It's about you and God this morning refuse, refuse to allow the world and the devil to tell you that you cannot be forgiven. That man, Jesus, our high priest, shed his blood one time for forgiveness of all sin for all time. You are forgiven. Do not believe the lie that you can never get right. Do not believe the lie that you can never be forgiven. Do not believe the lie that you cannot be set free. Do not believe the lie that you are beyond redemption. His offering for all sin, for all time. Now, as I pray over you, I want you to pray inside of your spirit. Whatever it is that is in your life, whatever it is that's been holding you back, whatever sin or addiction or problems or issues, you give it to God. You plead his blood and you will be set free. You are being made perfect through his sanctifying blood. As I pray over all of you, you pray inside of yourself. No matter what you've done, his shed blood forgives all sin for all time. In the name of Jesus, God, I ask that you would just begin to move in this place. Every person here, no matter what we face, no matter what we've been going through, God, I ask no matter what stronghold, what bondage, what chains we've allowed to remain in our life, in the name of Jesus, they are broken. They are broken in the name of Jesus, not through anything we do, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our high priest, who through his blood, his offering of blood, he has forgiven all sin for all time. Listen to me, in the name of Jesus, whatever has held